short and sweet and uh, to the point. And I love that about this portion of the scripture. I love as well. Uh, I like to I like candidness and uh, to some degree brusqueness or just being unassuming, just saying things the way they are. And uh, Jude. Uh, Jude doesn't mince words, doesn't waste words. It just gets right to the point. And this evening we're going to be looking uh, at a message, don't forget the bad example. Don't forget the bad example. So Jude, uh, chapter 3, and let's look down to verse 5. And uh, if you can't find chapter 3, just look down to verse 5. If you will, please. I've had so many people look at me like, huh? Jude chapter 1, verse 5. And uh, the Bible says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation but said the Lord rebuke thee but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they've gone the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Okay, well let's, let's ask the Lord to help us with our understanding, and to help us to have a clear, concise message this evening. Father, we do need help tonight. God, we wouldn't want in any way to allow notions or even humor or uh, anything that would to stand in the way of our understanding of the Scripture. And God, this passage of Scripture is vital for us because it warns us. It warns us first that we need to watch out for false teachers. Secondly, God, the Scripture warns us not to be false teachers. And I pray that we would receive the warning of the same we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the words that in the New Testament of the Scripture uh, that is cause for reflection in my life is the word that comes from the word apostasy. Apostasia. And the word literally means apo, which means from or away from, and uh, the truth. That is literally going away from truth, leaving truth. And I'm reminded of something we forget a lot of times, and that is that oftentimes false teachers came from the truth. Came from the truth. Um, the most dangerous heretics, and I mean heretics in the true sense of the word, the most dangerous heretics would be those individuals that know the truth and subvert it. Well, the best ways to defeat somebody at anything is to know thoroughly everything about them. And one of the best ways to draw people away from truth is to know the truth very thoroughly. And I'm warned and I'm surprised a little bit uh, that a person could know truth and do otherwise. And yet every person that goes to hell actually does that. Actually. There's not someone that, went, that goes to hell that said, you know, I really honestly believed... No, you really dishonestly believed. You weren't honest about the truth. The Bible says that God has placed in us enough knowledge of Him that there's no one that has an excuse. And so the Bible says even the character, the nature of God, the Godhead, the fact that He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, we can tell from creation and from being created. We have that knowledge put in us. And so any person that goes to hell goes to hell in spite of, not because of, truth. And uh, so I can't relate so much, and perhaps you can't. By the way, you don't need to be able to relate to everything and everybody, everywhere. Uh, I like what Paul said in Romans when he said, 
I would have you be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning the evil. And literally, you don't need to know everything about evil to be able to relate to it or understand it. I know people think you can't counsel a drug addict unless you've been a drug addict. You can't help an alcoholic unless you've been an alcoholic. Uh, you know, that, that trickles down. I know people think you can't be an expert on marriage until you've been divorced and failed a few times, you know. So forth. that's nonsense. You want to find out how to not be an alcoholic, find somebody that isn't an alcoholic. <laughs> Figure out what they do. Uh, you find somebody, you want to find someone who isn't a drug addict, find out what the habits and the lifestyle is of a person who's never touched drugs. What are the characteristics of a person that says, I won't touch it? I'm going to tell you something, you learn some things about holiness from that person, and perhaps uh, you wouldn't have trouble with some of the things that you struggle with, and so on and so forth. But we don't think logically sometimes about things. We think that we have to be able to relate to something in order to be able to, you know, understand it or get help in that area. Now, I would not say at all that a testimony of someone who's found victory in their life isn't a help. Don't misunderstand where I'm going with it this evening. I'm not throwing out the baby with the bath, but I'm just telling you that sometimes the way we think is a little convoluted. It's a little bit illogical. So, keeping that in mind as we look at the Scripture this evening, I want us to remember that a person who teaches false doctrine, a false teacher, is not someone who got it wrong, quote. It's not someone who failed to understand or didn't have the ability to assemble the facts or it's not someone who uh, just didn't have the right life circumstances for them to arrive at the right conclusion. You know, I'll be, I, I will be the first to admit that the premise of a person oftentimes affects the conclusions that they come to. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk to young people about dating, whether a teenager should date or not. It's a real good idea to talk to teenagers who aren't dating yet before you suggest to them that being in a relationship where you give your heart away, uh, you, better be, uh, you better be something that you know God wants you to marry that person. Why? Well, because you're more open to it when you're not involved in it already. Um, you try to convince somebody something that they're involved in already is not good or isn't right, you have a tough time. It is a tough sell. Denominationalism capitalizes on that. You know that? How do Catholics get Catholics? How do they get converts? Well, they've been working real hard the last couple of years, actually. Catholics are on all the radio stations, on television programs, Catholic apologists who are working on trying to either hold on to the people that are in their congregations or trying to even, in some cases, win some uh, folks. They're, they're working hard on it. The truth of the matter is, how does a Catholic get a Catholic? Well, you baptize a baby and tell him he's a Catholic and don't ever let him think otherwise. That's the premise. You understand where I'm coming from? You tell them things that keep them from thinking. And the truth of the matter is that all of us have preconceptions. Don't we? Don't we? I mean, there are a lot of things that I found out that I believed that are correct, that are biblical, but I didn't, I, I, I didn't believe them just because they're correct and biblical initially. I believed them because that's just what I always believed. There are things that I've done, it's just what I've always done. And sometimes I go examine the Scripture and I find out, okay, is this right? Is this biblical? I found out sometimes, well, I always thought that, <laughs> but it's not right. It's not scriptural, it's not biblical. I've always done that, but uh, that isn't God's way. So we need to think as believers, and we need to be, if there's anyone in the world that ought to be open-minded, in the true sense of the word, it ought to be people that believe that this book came from God and that's the final authority on things. But you know a lot of people that are closed-minded about this book. If it doesn't fit their circumstances, their bent, their persuasion, their situation, uh, then they will just close their minds to it. And friend, therein you have the making of a false teacher. I believe personally that some false teachers that are mentioned, for instance, in Jude, I believe that there would be some who would teach false doctrine who could be born again, although it seems as though the bent or the gist of what we see addressed and we'll see this evening as we're warned about it, that those individuals, are, that they're people that are reserved for damnation. And so they're not believers in Jude. You study a lot of the, uh, of the Gospels and you'll just see people that got off and moved away. And the very word 
apostasia, that very word is a word that means a person who has been in the truth, who's known the truth, who's gone away from the truth. And therein, believers, we ought to be warned. We ought to be warned. So it's always interesting when you look at the sins that beset people. Last week when we were at teen camp, Brother Troy Carlson said something that I thought I could relate to pretty well. He said, you know, it's not the big battles. It's not the great battles that test my faith usually. I see something that's just a major obstacle or a major problem. He said, I immediately know, God, I need help. I just immediately go to the Lord and ask God for help. He said, I don't have problems with that. He said, it's the little things. It's the piddly things that get me. And you know that's kind of true doctrine. Like, the devil knows that. He knows, man, you come at them with a full on assault, they're going to get scared and they're going to go to God for help. But if you can get man to trust the, the uh, trust his own wisdom or trust his own strength on something, you'll, you will undermine, you'll miss it. I believe that uh, believers get away from truth oftentimes because of pride. Because they just think, well, I'm, I can handle this. I'm strong enough. I'm wise enough. And friend, uh, we need to have the kind of heart's attitude and the kind of humility that says, but for the grace of God, I could be a false teacher. But for the grace of God, I could be the one teaching false doctrine. And we need to have enough humility to just simply say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep an open book and I'll keep an open mind to the book. Okay, so not open to, uh, not open to wrong things, but open to truth. Okay, now, uh, I want to look this evening at a few verses. And really, just want to look at, don't forget the bad examples. Uh, bad examples. It, it's it's my last service I preached today, and so you folks have the benefit of speaking to some. It's a little bit tired uh, tonight, so I'm not quite as sharp as I'd like to be, though I may be sharper than I was earlier. Who knows? Uh, it doesn't take much to be, you know, low standard. <laughs> uh, but I, I think of, I was trying to think of personal examples, of bad examples. I know when I was a kid, many, many times my parents pointed out people that messed up their lives and said, don't do that or you'll end up like them. And I can't remember them specifically. Most of us had that. Remember the story of the little boy that cried wolf? Little boy that cried wolf. Uh, my wife, I hear her say this sometimes when she's working with children. She says, don't shriek or don't scream unless you're in a lot of trouble because it sounds like things are really bad. So when you're playing, uh, my wife's standard is that children should not shriek like scream, like shrill screams, because that's a sound that you make only when you're in danger. And so she says, if you do that, and then if there's a real danger, and you scream and shriek all the time, nobody will know there's a problem. They won't recognize a distinct sound of this is a problem, so don't do that. And that's sort of the same thing as the little boy who cried wolf. You know the story, don't you, Josiah, the little boy who cried wolf? Okay, well, Josiah knows the story, so you can ask him about it later. And tell you. Okay, so I don't have to tell you. But the moral of the story of the little boy who cried wolf is that if you cry for help and you don't really need help and you're just doing it to be funny or for entertainment, then it, a real circumstance could actually happen and people won't take you seriously. And because people won't take you seriously, you could be in danger and the wolves will eat you or something like that. Um, is that the story, Josiah? Josiah knows it correctly. He can tell it to you. But the story is given for an example. In other words, this is what could happen if you do the wrong thing. These aren't stories. These are actually examples that are given. This isn't the only text of the Scripture where something like this is listed, but Jude gives a very, very terse, very specific examples of why there's a great danger in false teaching and why, uh, as you, if you were to look later, why these are individuals that are spots in the Feast of Charity and these are individuals that we have to earnestly contend against. Don't forget that contending seems contentious, please. Don't forget that contenders seem to be contentious. And I'm not talking about a good fishing boat. I'm talking about people who contend, people who fight. You can't fight without seeming like a fighter. And so we need to have a good spirit about us. We need to present truth and love. We also need to stand for what's right. And I'll tell you where we need to spend our time contending. We need to contend for God's people that are being taken away by false teachers. It's so frustrating to me to see so many believers get caught up and false teaching. I'll tell you, false teachers are aggressive. And they don't go after their own converts. False teachers never going to go to a door, knock on a door, present the gospel to someone, get them saved, and then lead them astray. They're going to go to the church, and they're going to find someone else that someone else has loved and labored over and cared for and try to lead them astray. So don't forget about where the false teacher is going to be found. 
You're not going to find the false teacher in the coffee shop. You're going to find him in the Sunday school class. You're going to find him in the church house because that's where they prey on people who they want to lead astray. Don't forget about the motive of a false teacher. And I, I'll be honest with you. My wife will tell you, some of you all think I'm not like this, but I honestly give people the benefit of the doubt a lot more than people realize. I really do. I, when the Bible says, thinketh no evil, I try to do that. And I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of people that have been doing evil, and I've just thought, no, they can't be. Because I just don't want to think evil. I say, oh, it's, no, it's, I'm mistaken. I misunderstand. I, I'm sure it isn't what I think it is. I, I don't want to think evil. And, and that tends to be that tends to be me. And as a believer, we've got to be really careful about uh, recognizing that what you do is what you are. In other words, what you do represents what's in your heart. What you say represents... Uh, what's in your heart and what you do represents what you, what's in your heart. And go ahead and call it what it is. Okay, so Jude spends a little time lambasting, and I kind of like it. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of political correctness. I believe, uh, I'm not a fan of our current president on a personal level. I'll just tell you something. I just don't think Donald Trump's a good man. He may be a good president, but I don't think he's a good man. I've, uh, I've mentioned my reservations before about him. But I believe he got elected because he rejected the notions of political correctness. And I think it was just reflect, re, refreshing. Uh, if you're a sports fan and you watch basketball very much right now, there's a guy named LeVar Ball that's getting a lot of attention right now just because he's so obnoxious. But what people like about him is that he doesn't really care what people think. I, I think he does some things for shock value. But a lot of what he does is he just says what everybody else is thinking wishes they had the courage to say. He's not politically correct about it. He's wildly popular, actually. And, uh, you know, it's the same as true. And I'll tell you something. It's because political correctness isn't true. It's not correct to truth. It's just correct to how you present things. It doesn't matter what the message is so long as it doesn't offend. It's the concept of political correctness. The problem with that is that it does matter what the message is. Truth does matter. Uh, error does matter. And so... I like this about Jude. Jude doesn't pull any punches. I mean, he just straight up says, he said, I wrote unto you to earnestly contend for the faith. And then in verse 5, he said, I will therefore put you in remembrance. He said, I want you to remember something. And so he's going to use stories that these people know, and he's going to use them for an example. He said, uh, uh, the Lord, how about the Lord, verse 5, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. When I was growing up, I thought, I think I thought, I think I just always thought, that the people, the children of Israel were the good guys and the Egyptians were the bad guys. Did you think that? In other words, who's, who's the good guy, the slave or the slaveholder? Who would you rather be, the slave or the slaveholder? Now, don't be carnal about it. Think, think honestly about it. Whose conscience would you like to go to bed with at night? The slave or the slaveholders? I'd rather be a slave. I could always kill my slave master, you know. Or okay. uh, I'd rather be a slave than a slave uh, than, than to have slaves, because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have to live with anything that I'd done wrong if I held a slave or if I if I were a slave. But I'd have to live with it if I were a slave. And God, I believe that God did create man in His image and doesn't want man to lord over another man in that sort of a way. And so. Uh, that being said, when I when I grew up hearing the story, you know, Moses and the bulrushes, you know, I don't know if it's bulrushes or not, but Moses in the little ark that his, uh, that his mom made and his sister hide him, you know, and the great story about how God used Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. I thought that the Egyptians were good guys, but I overlooked some things. One thing I overlooked was the fact that when Moses defended his kinsman and or his fellow man, his brother, his brother, with someone that was his was a Hebrew as well as himself, that they ratted him out. <laughs> I mean, they basically told on him, and they told him, "You're not going to rule over us. You're going to what? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian?" They didn't want to follow him. When God sent Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, they never asked God to do that. They never said, "God, please send a deliverer. We'll even accept Moses if you send him." No, they never asked for anything. God said, it's time to, get, time to get my people out of Egypt. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. They never said, God, we want to be delivered. When they went into the desert, they said Egypt was better. We don't like what you did, God. Egypt was better. The food was better. 
the environment was what we liked. And uh, as a result of the rebellion, you remember their carcasses dropped off. They died in the in the in the wilderness. Two of them got to enter into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb, two believers. Two of them. I'm reminded about the children of Israel and about their rebellion and about their false doctrine. I mean, it didn't take them a minute for Moses to go up on the mountain for them to tell Aaron, make us gods. And make golden calves and worship and say, these are the gods that brought us. And Aaron said, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. And they said, these are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. And they, and they worshiped false gods. It didn't take them a second to do that. They never were believers. They weren't believers. God was going to use them. God had covenant promises with Moses and with Jacob, but they weren't believers. And so uh, they, were, they were rebels. They were rebellious against God and they were polluting and corrupting the truth. And so the Bible says in verse 5, Jude simply said, he said, I want you to remember that the same God that saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believed not. How many, how many of those who were delivered from Egypt were with the next generation when they entered into the promised land? Two. Two. Joshua and Caleb, right? Okay, so Joshua and Caleb entered the rest into the promised land. How many, how many people did God deliver out of Egypt? Half a million. Probably about two and a half million. Probably about two and a half million people. That God delivered out of the land of Egypt, sustained in the wilderness for 40 years while their children grew up and became believers for the most part. Two went into the promised land. There's always a reminder, isn't there, that the majority is usually wrong. Mm -hmm. Imagine the thanking of the rebels. <laughs> What's God going to kill all of us? Huh. You know, so and so thinks the same as I do. You can always get collusion, can't you? You can always get people to agree with wrong. And it's not that difficult. And the reminder here is, don't forget that after God delivered the people, well, God's not going to kill us. He delivered us from Egypt. That's what they thought. After God delivered us from Egypt, the Bible says He destroyed them that believed not. All but two. All but two. Isn't that amazing? Now you recognize that there would be individuals like Moses and Aaron and Myron that were part of that generation that God said wouldn't be allowed in the promised land. But the reason they weren't allowed is they didn't have the same faith as Joshua and Caleb did. God's not going to judge me. God's not going to judge me is oftentimes an argument or a description of a false teacher. And the reminder is, God destroyed a whole nation because of unbelief. God will judge you. God is a judge, and He would be an evil judge if He did not judge according to His holiness. Any person that thinks, well, we, or I'm part of the large enough majority, we will be the exception, ignores the fact that God allowed entire nation of Israel with the exception of Joshua and Caleb to die in the wilderness never entering the promised land never seeing the promise what will God do in judgment of false teachers well he'll the judgment the angels verse 6 okay well you know he judges people but I mean there's certain limits you know some people think they're untouchable the Bible says in the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation he hath reserved and everlasting chains unto darkness, under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. God judged the children of Israel, and God judged the, the angels which followed Satan. Can you think of the excuses that unbelievers could make for those angels who followed Lucifer? Can you think of the excuses that they would make? Well, God, you made Lucifer. If you didn't want him to rebel against you, why'd you create him? God, that isn't right. I'd rather be with Him than with you. There are a lot of people that they think they're more just, that they're more right than God is. And they'll choose the wrong side because they judge God out of their corrupt system of values, out of their corrupt form of judgment. 
truth of the matter is, is that we do live in an age, actually, where it is more correct to allow evil than to stand or say that there's good. Isn't it? We live in a day and age in which it's more correct to allow evil than to say that there's good. It's, it's nuts. It's, it's, it's insane. But it's a day and age in which we live in. And it's not new. There's just new cycles or it seems like some things become predominant at different times. But it's a time in which we live in. I want to illustrate that because I want to move along. Let's look at the example in verse 7 of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner going, giving themselves over uh, to fornication. That's, that's a sexual sin. Going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I remind you of the audacity of the audacity of the Sodomites, the people who lived in Gomorrah. They had no shame. You remember when God sent the angels to just Lot? And they wanted to commit sin against the angels? They didn't, they didn't have any barriers. They, 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 they had total lack of shame. And believe anything was wrong or evil. You say, Pastor, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, here it's described as fornication going after strange flesh. That would really um, fit the description of actual sodomy we would call that today homosexuality. You know, if I were to say today homosexuality is damnable, there would be people who would sooner judge me than judge the sodomite. It's true, isn't it? In other words, some of y'all look at me like, Pastor, I can't believe you just said that. What a terrible person you are. What about a person who perverts what God has made and said is good? Who's the evil person? One who agrees with God or one who does evil? That wasn't a debate 30 years ago among rational people. It wasn't a debate 15 years ago among most rational people. And today, I'll just tell you, just walk out in the public, in the general public, and say what I just said, and you'll be branded as a hater. And I'll just tell you something. There's probably not a person in the world who has more love for people that are in sexual sin, more compassion for people than myself. And I'm just, that's not a brag, that's the truth. I have a great deal of compassion. I've probably won more people and helped more people than most people I know that are caught up in sexual sin. But it's sin. And you can't get help by saying that truth is error and error is truth. And so we see the description, there's no shame for the sin. No shame in, in, in those places. Verse 8 is the word likewise. Okay, so we had the description of the children of Israel. We or the example, I should say, of the children of Israel. We had the example of the angels. And we had the example of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're told that false teachers are most similar to the Sodomites. Likewise. Now, the precedent would include... The precedent would include the context of the other two, but when it describes why they're similar, you'll see that the similarities bear out with the Sodomites and not with the otherwise. Look at verse 8. These filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Filthy dreamers, the idea is sensual dreams. Hmm. Sensual dreams. Literally, they dream of sexual or perverted things. And that's just about as descriptive as I'd like to be on that, more than I would like to be actually, but that's what the Bible says. And I understand that they dream of filthy things. And the Bible says they defile the flesh. Uh, I need to bring this back. When I was a kid, they used to have dye, clothing dye. You know what I'm talking about, right? They used to dye clothing. <laughs> Yeah, no, not no, Joel. Sidetrack, huh? Rejected. No, not just tie dye, dye. Like where you'd say, "Well, I wish this pair of this shirt was green," because everything turns out green when you try to dye it anyway. Uh, that's my experience. Gray or green, it doesn't matter what color you try to dye it. But you take a T-shirt, it's white. You want to dye it a different color, and so you put a dye or a stain in the washing machine, and then that and everything you wash after that will be stained. 
some color other than the color you desired. You never get the right color. That's probably why they don't do it anymore. But they used to dye clothing, you know, dye cloth and so forth. And the idea here of the word of uh, the, uh, if you, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to, need to read it specifically. Uh, ah, defile, uh, of defiling the flesh is the same idea as dying or staining the flesh, okay? So taking something that would be what it's supposed to be, whatever that color is, and then defiling it or staining it, getting it dirty. They defile the flesh. In other words, they literally make themselves filthy. There's something all over them, filthiness. Uh, the Bible says, they're, they're dreamers, it says they defile the flesh, dye with another color, or stain, make it different than what it's supposed to be. You see, make it different than what it's supposed to be. The sodomites, what was their sin? Well, it was... Uh, it was uh, similar to what we would call the sin of sodomy today, actually. And what they did was they took what you're supposed to be and they made it something else, stained and changed it. Um, in verse 8, they despise dominion. And uh, the word despise is do away with. They hate it, away with it. Despise it. And uh, dominion uh, is a word, same word we use for Lord. Same word we use for Lord or Lordship. So they despise Lordship, and I'm not speaking in context of what we would call Lordship in the spiritual realm. I'm just talking about authority. Somebody who has authority, they hate it, they despise it. And so didn't have any respect at all, the Sodomites did, and these individuals don't despise authority. Most false teachers hate the concept of church offices as taught in the Scripture. The Bible teaches that in the church there are offices of pastors and deacons. The Bible plainly lays that out. It's amazing how false teachers don't like that. They'll redefine or rename or create roles or titles, and they want to take away uh, those offices and the authority that comes with them. Shepherd. What's the word shepherd mean? What's the word? What's a? What is a synonym for the word shepherd in your Bible? Pastor. Pastor. Bishop. Poimane. What is a? What is a shepherd? What does a shepherd do? Guide the flock. Okay, so he uses the word guide, but you know he is a lord, an overseer. Actually, now we want shepherds to guide. You know, it's all sit in a circle. And let's, whichever way the circle moves, the shepherd will move with us. No, a shepherd says, okay, we need the sheep to be over here. And so, yeah, I'm going to lead them. The shepherd leads the sheep, so I'm going to go here, and you all need to come. If you don't come, I'm break your leg. Or, I'm kidding. Uh, if you don't come, then there's going to be consequences for it or whatever. Shepherd guy is the Lord. And these are individuals who say, nobody's telling me anything. <clears throat> None of us like to be told what to do. Nobody likes to be told what to do. I don't like to be told what to do. You don't like to be told what to do. But God created authority, and He did so on purpose, and it's so important that God actually describes the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and He describes these individuals who are false teachers in the church as individuals that despise dominion. Now, you know I believe in congregational authority. I respect the priesthood of the believer. The Holy Spirit of God lives in every believer, and we ought to be able to, as a believer, have God use us but I do believe, I believe in authority. I don't believe in authority because I'm a pastor. I'll be quite honest with you. I had rather be under authority than be the authority any day of the week. It's far easier to be under authority if you're a good one than to be, uh, than to be the authority if you're a good one. I'd rather be under a good authority than be a good authority because it's tough. It's tough. These are individuals that hate the very concept of it. They're, they get rankled. They get irritated. When you tell them there's any such thing as authority, and as you know, they, they answer every question with, what authority do you have? By what authority? They hate it. They despise it. Away with the authority. We don't need authority. Anarchy. Anarchists. It's in the church, and false teachers don't like authority because authority is usually 
what is exercised when they're dealt with. There's no such thing as church discipline without authority. No such thing as church discipline without authority. These people despise authority just like the Sodomites did. Anthony, no more laughing until we're done. It's not funny. Stay, stay focused, okay? Then uh, the word lordship, curiates or curios, Lord, same word we use for Lord. And then I want to look at um, just two, two more quick things here. Um, the Bible says, uses the idea, the concept of um, dignities. They speak evil of dignities. And, the, and, and speak evil is two words, same word that we use for blasphemy. Blasphemy. And uh, uh, dockard, the word uh, for uh, a judge. A judge. So they speak evil of judges, the Bible says. Or they blaspheme judges or judgment. It's ironic, isn't it? When you think of the terms and the words, judge, judgment. What do we say most about judging? Don't. Thou shalt not. My brother used to like to say just for fun. I think he was making fun. I know he's making fun of people. But say it. You don't know me. You can't judge me. And there are people that literally, you want to find out what's going on with a person, pretend to judge them. And you'll find out what's going on really fast. Um, you shouldn't do things like this for fun. But um, sometimes... Sometimes you can say some things to people that claim that their situation is one thing and you can tell them what it actually is and you'll find out how, what they think about authority or being judged, judgment. Sweeping generalizations, understanding that there's always the rare exception which you've never met and don't actually know about but hypothetically could exist. Why are most people homeless? Has nobody ever loved them? Could be true, couldn't it? Does, does it make you homeless to not be loved by anybody? Stop a second. Let's deal with that. If nobody ever loved you, why don't you come to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? We'll love you. If nobody ever loved me. Well, it's not true. There's people that love you. You don't want anything to do with the people that would. Actually, that's true. I would say there's churches all around the world that have good, godly people in it that love sinners. Mm -hmm. After the example of Christ, that would be very compassionate and very loving towards you if you'd let them. Mm -hmm. All those people, they judge me there. Why don't you judge them when you say that? What, what kind of statement is it when you say about people? When you say someone's judgmental, what have you just done? you just judged them, haven't you? When you say what someone thinks, what have you just done? You've just passed judgment. You don't know. You've judged them the same way that you say. All right, so all things being equal, uh, accepting the exception, which probably is only hypothetical and you really don't know about, but you can tell me about something and I bet you you'd still be wrong about it. Why are most people homeless? They keep doing the same wrong things. They keep doing the same wrong things. It's interesting, Brother Tony and I one time, we, we just went out neutrally and just interviewed homeless people. And it, didn't, it wasn't a spiritual project. It was more he wanted to use his camera for something. So let's go interview some people. Homeless people like to be interviewed, so we went and interviewed them. You know? uh, I had a conver we had a conversation. I just asked questions, and Tony just videoed it. And uh, I asked the homeless guys what a solution would be. I said, what's, basically, this is the summary. What, was your, what the problem was? And they said, well, the problem is we're homeless. I said, well, what's the solution for it? And uh, and so we're getting a job solve your homelessness. Well, I several I, I work a job. Okay, so job isn't going to be your solution, <laughs> is it? That was amazing. We went through all kinds of things. If I just had, then I wouldn't be homeless. We went through all these things, and we realized that not a single one of those things would solve their homelessness. Why is a person home? I, I'm not trying to pick. I don't hate homeless people. I don't have anything against homeless people. I have compassion for those people. And if they'd like help, I'd like to help them. But what's the problem with with people? What makes them homeless? Well, their worldview doesn't work. That's what the problem is. 
you know, worldview doesn't work. You can't tell me it's wrong to, to smoke a little bit of bud. There's nothing wrong with smoking weed. There's nothing wrong with uh, drinking a little bit of beer. There's nothing wrong with living in sin. There's nothing wrong with it. They'll tell you what there's nothing wrong with. And I'll tell you something. The thing that they say there's nothing wrong with is the cause of their problem. Isn't it? If you're honest about it. The thing there's nothing wrong with is the cause of the problem. It doesn't have to be homeless. It could be anything. Anybody's got a problem. And they'll tell you, you're wrong about my problem. The problem is, is that God's the one that says what's wrong and what's right. And they disagree with God. And so it isn't me that's right. It's not them that's wrong because they disagree with me. It's the fact that anyone who disagrees with God is wrong and your way is just not going to work. There's a way that seemeth right in a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Uh, you may be able to logically say, oh, there's no, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh. and you use all the arguments you like to. The fact of the matter is, if you don't do it God's way, then you will face God's judgment. That's a fact. It's indisputable. And the judgment itself is a testimony against those who say there's nothing wrong with it. Despise judgment. Despise judgment. I've had so many people say, you know, I, don't just, I could do without your judgment. And I just try to help somebody. I had the guy a couple weeks ago. He hasn't called me a couple weeks. The guy a couple weeks ago has called me all the time. And I told him, I said, you know, he said, he, what he wants every time he calls is a hotel for the night. Hmm. He just wants a hotel for one night. And I told him, I said, to be honest with you, I can't just afford to be giving people hotels for the night. Mm -hmm. uh, but I said, I would do that if it were a help. If it would help you, I'd get you. What do you mean it won't help me? I'll get a shower, I'll get whatever, whatever, whatever. So it won't help you. It's, you're going to be just the same off or worse. Every time, he's literally called me a couple of times a month. Every time he spoke to me, his condition, his situation was worse than it was the time before. It was getting worse and worse and worse. I said, I'd like to help you. So he told us, every time he calls, I ask, do you go to this church? He knows good and well he doesn't go to this church. Uh, do, you, do you attend this church? No, I don't attend that church. You know, I shouldn't have to attend your church for you people to help me. Well, yeah, you should actually. You're wrong about that. That'd be a help to you. Um, and I had to tell the guy, last time I spoke with him, I said, you know something? The what you do doesn't work. What you're doing, the way you think, doesn't work. So until you change the way you think, your situation is going to continue to deteriorate, but it's never going to get better. It can get worse, but it can't get better. And you know, guys, that's a fact that any reasonable, logical person could see and agree with. But he said, you know, I, 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 can, you know, you don't need, I don't need you judging me. They despise judgment. Can you imagine going to a doctor that way? How, people do. How effective is it to go to a doctor and he tells you there's something wrong? You know, you're fat. I'm not fat. <laughs> How many people like to be told they're fat? Not really anybody ever, right? I don't like it, but it's a fact. And uh, when the scale says certain things to me, I got to listen to it, or it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have problems, right? Nobody wants to be told that, but if it's the truth, you know, say like, okay. You got high blood pressure, you need to change your diet. I don't have high blood pressure. One reason my blood pressure is high is because you checked it just now, and it was high just now, but it isn't normally high. Yeah, you know, so on, so on. no. You know, there's people they don't want they, they don't want a doctor to tell them what's wrong. You know, you got cancer. I do not have cancer. I rebuke the notion that I have cancer. Well, it's not gonna, I mean, people do that, don't they? I know people they they refuse to agree with or believe anything, and that's the way they are about whatever. And if you're that way about things that are wrong in your life, my friend, you're just like a false teacher. They'll speak evil of dignitaries. They'll tell you what's wrong with the people that aren't wrong. But they don't want to be told what's wrong with them when they're wrong. It's interesting, isn't it? I've said it before, and I think it's interesting to note, that a false teacher, and generally speaking, anyone who is a deceiver and a liar, always accuses the other person of doing what they're actually doing. It happens with dictators. Adolf Hitler, before he attacked any country, accused the countries of attacking him. Attacking his people. We went into Poland and he had a bunch of uh, German prisoners. He dressed them up as 
Polish soldiers and then uh, went to a radio station and killed the people in the radio station and then killed all the prisoners with Polish uniforms, Polish military uniforms on. So they attacked us. They're attacking me. Uh, when he went into Austria, he did the very same thing. He accused him of attacking the people. When he went into the Rhineland, he did the same thing. He said, you know, you're attacking the Germanic peoples. No, he was, he, was, he said, you're trying to expand your territories. You're trying to attack us. No, that's what he was doing. <laughs> it wasn't what they were doing. It's what he was doing. That's generally what a false teacher does. He usually accuses people. You're judging me. No, actually, he's judging you. Opposite tactics. And to this evening, though, in conclusion, what I want us to be warned about is what actually happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. What actually happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says, was that they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah got burned. And still the people, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, are burning today. And so I want to say this evening that we've seen several examples. We've seen examples of the audacity of the false teachers. We could go on and say more about these things, but I think for sake of time we should not. What to remember about the false examples is that they hate judgment, but they're ultimately, universally, always judged by the just judge and ruler of the universe, God Himself. So I'm a little bit afraid to be a false teacher, and so should you be. And I believe in contending against false teachers remembering that their end is destruction and those that they deceive along with them have the same end. So I'm afraid not to contend with false teachers. And so should you be. And that's what Jude's warning us about. We'll see some concluding remarks next week. Father, thank you for what you taught us this evening. I pray that you would help us to remember it, to be warned not to be, and to be warned to stand up against false teachers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.